to realize I've chosen that theme, oh my word, is <laughs> because, because it's often what we say when we are feeling desperate. Oh my word. But more significantly is when you wake up, the first thing I do is to switch on the lamp. Is the power on or isn't it? <laughs> oh my word. But you see, what we say is, good morning God, a lovely day without power. Or we say, oh God, not another day without power. And we've got to ask, which will it be? Are we able to make our words count for something positive or something negative? Because the negative has a vibration that does this. It's like a wave that knocks you over. The positive is like a wave that gives you a lift up and you feel that you are being lifted by the community of believers who want to say, good morning, Lord, you are in control. Amen. Amen. And I think that's really how um, the word that we want to read is a reflection of being challenged by every word we speak and we'll, we'll read in a minute but it's this morning I want to say it's the condition of our hearts that makes us accountable for what we say and we all need to ask this question what kind of words come from my mouth it's a, it's a, it's a very significant question what kind of words come from my mouth and our words are an indication of our attitude to life. And, and so when you realize that the condition of our hearts is what we've got to put right, not our words, it's our hearts. And it's a heart problem. And we can't just clean up our speech and say, oh, well, now, mm, mm, mm. I'll zip up my lips the next time I'm angry because the anger's here. It's not there, it's here. And so this is really what Pam's going to put up the reading for us this morning. It comes from Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to um, reflect on that as the basis. Thank you, Pam. I'll need to read it from there as well because I didn't bring my copy. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And then we go on to chapter 5. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once in darkness, 
So you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Thus far. And I think what we realise that Jesus was... This was Paul writing to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, which was a crossroad for a lot of people moving in and out, and not all knew the Lord. But those Christians who were to be the salt and light were called to live a life of holiness, separateness. And that's, that was the reading that will be our, the basis for which I, I speak. Oh my word, speaking, on, speaking the truth in love. Jesus also had a word that is not going to be on the screen, but I'm going to refer to it. He was confronted by the Pharisees for something he had done. And he shook his head and he responded with great conviction. Now I'll tell you what it was. The Pharisees wanted to know by whose power Jesus had healed a demon-possessed man who was also blind and dumb. The people who witnessed this miracle said, could this be the son of David, the long-awaited Messiah, the son of God? And the Pharisees did this, not so. It is only by Beelzebub the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus, the prince of demons, an agent of Satan, the father of all lies. What were these Pharisees talking about? And Jesus knew their hearts and he challenged them. He didn't just ignore their comments, he challenged them. And this is what he said. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? <coughs> For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that is a, a sentence that struck me between the eyes. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so our words are an indication of the attitude of our attitude to life. And, and as I said, we can't solve a heart problem by just cleaning up our speech. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us with new attitudes and motives. And this is where it is a heart thing that God wants to do this morning, to, ch to challenge our words. The psalmist. There's several psalms, and I just want to quote one line from about three psalms. Psalm 40, 19 verse 4 ends with this prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 139 ends like this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And then in Psalm 51, David prays, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, nor take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Those are all well-known lines out of those psalms. So it seems to me that this searching of our heart, hearts needs to be done daily. Because I tell you what, in Matthew 12, listen to this, this is the warning that also comes as a, 
is a powerful word. Right. This is Jesus in response to the Pharisees when they called him the son of Beelzebub or whatever they called him. He said this, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you, this is Jesus talking, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless, idle or empty, every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. Now, I'll tell you the truth, I have never heard or read a sermon on this, and it's taken me a long time, as David knows, to decide, well, Lord, what do I say? That's, that's a serious warning. For by the words, by your words, you will be acquitted, and by the words, you will be condemned. Everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every word they have spoken. So I have to ask myself this morning, what kind of words have we got stored up in our hearts? And that's a personal checklist, but I think the Ephesians reading has been helpful. The first verse that I want to refer to from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 to 32, to answer this question is, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Thank you. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, you don't often have somebody <coughs> listening in when you counsel one-on-one, -on -one, but it's still, it's a message. No unwholesome talk. The second one. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Unwholesome talk, bitterness, rage, and anger. Get rid of it. Well, how do we deal with bitterness, rage, or anger? One book I read says, well, if you express it, it's likely to come as a a barrage of bad words. When you're angry, whether it's in the car or in public or somebody does something stupid, you want to give them a mouthful and you feel they deserve it. So here it goes. <laughs> you say what comes out of the heart. You are angry. Now that's expressing it. But what if you suppress it? Is that good for you? When you suppress anger over the years, there is a bitterness that creeps in towards that person or that situation or that condition that festers. And I'm saying this because doctors see more patients with heart problems because they have not dealt with anger or some emotion that has been building up, building up, building up. So express it or suppress it. I have a third alternative because I have to be truthful that I can be angry and I don't like myself when I'm angry and then I don't know what to do with the anger and what I've learned to do with it is to write myself a letter and it's actually to God. Lord, I'm not handling this situation very well. He says, my child, I see that. What's the problem? 
Well, Lord, this is the problem. And then I write it out. Okay, so you've got a choice. What are you going to do about your problem? So then I write my answer. And then I say to myself, well, do I share that or don't I share it? And he says, you do not share it. You put it in your Bible and you leave it there for a month and then decide whether the problem is still a problem. But sometimes when you've written that kind of dialogue, in fact, Abraham Lincoln wrote a book. I read this, I was fascinated by his life. He said there were so many politicians that made him so angry that if he told every politician what he thought of them, he would have been shot long before he was shot. Um, and he said he would write these angry letters to the person, but he would never send them. And that struck me as humility you write the anger down, but you do not divulge it. You don't send it, you don't send emails, you don't send WhatsApps. How quickly we offend somebody by sending a message that should never have been sent. Agree. And that is the danger. So, what do we do with bitterness, rage and anger? We have to convert it with the Holy Spirit by being, when you've got over your anger, be kind, be compassionate, forgiving each other. Just as Christ has forgiven you, you have got the problem, not the other person. It's you with the problem. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, I see now it's my problem. So that helps us to deal then with the next verse which is now um, chapter 5, which says this. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's quite sad if you say there's somebody who's walking around here who looks like they've got a bad smell under their nose. You know what that means? They, mm, they are looking like life is just not a fragrant offering, but a, an unhappy feeling. So how do you convert that? Love is the key. Building others up according to their needs that it may benefit others. So you say something nice to somebody, it passes on, it passes on, it passes on. That I think is the secret. Be kind and compassionate means that we ask ourselves, is what I'm going to say kind, necessary or true? Count to five before you say it. Is it kind, necessary, or true? Otherwise, don't say it. Say nothing. Or say something positive. But don't be caught in this web of, being, um, of, of, of making life difficult for other people. I think what Jesus is saying in his commandment to love is very clear. Love me the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your words, every part of you, love me. And love your neighbour in the same way you want to be loved yourself. And I, I suspect that this is the problem. There's not enough love in the world. And maybe, maybe we look back on our childhood, home life, and that wasn't a very happy experience. Maybe there was no positive affirmation. Maybe it was a home where there was divorce or death or absent parent. Never enough love to go around. So you've got a chip on your shoulder. Then, what, when that happens, you've got a chip on your shoulder, you, you, you actually then want to get back at life. And, and you find yourself linked up with people whose code of behavior is one of revenge or you go into a gang 
And that doesn't help the situation. And when you want to say, oh my God, the blasphemy can be swung around. You say, oh Lord, I'm not coping today. And avoid blasphemy. I mean, it's not just non-Christians. You say, oh my God, it's actually offensive. And it comes from Exodus 20. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. When last did we read the third commandment of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Well, it equally, equally means don't say, Lord, I love you, and then behave as if you don't love him. If you can't love the neighbor who you see, how can you love God who you can't see? It's, it's a very clear warning. And this is the warning. I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless, idle, empty word they have spoken. So what is the good news? The good news is live as children of the light. Paul, the apostle, was writing from prison. How easily he could have complained about his condition, but he didn't. He said, give thanks in all situations. Not for all situations, but give thanks. And you might remember, Paul wasn't a saint in those earlier days. Do you remember how he went on his way to, on the Damascus Road, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples? Well, he wasn't in favor of Christians. He said that they were an abomination to the Jewish faith. So how did he get around that? Well, God got around it and sent the Holy Spirit and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the light of God's blinding love cut him short in his tracks. He was taken to the home to, and Ananias went to visit him and remember how the healing came through his eyes, through his speech. And so this persecutor of God's followers, Christ's followers, became the missionary with a heart on fire for his Lord. And that is the good news that our words and behavior mirror the love of God. You might also remember the 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul says, you may I speak in the words of angels that have not love. I'm just a noisy gong <laughs> or a clanging cymbal. So, so that's another reminder that our words must be with God's love attached to them. So it's really, as I, as I wind this up, I realize it's only when we come under Holy Spirit conviction that it's what we say, how we say it, the tone of our voice, our body language, that, I mean, you can just roll your eyes to the ceiling and do this. You've not said a word. What does the other person think you're saying? Oh, she's a fool. Oh, no, not again. Hmm. You see, it's not only our words, it's our body language to speak. But I believe the secret lies in asking the Holy Spirit to cleanse us from the inside, that the heart, mind and spirit would be cleansed from all ungodliness. And then we'll ask, for wisdom, to know when to speak and when not to speak. I mean, haven't you found that? Don't ask David to raise a question just before I'm going to bed, because he will get a mouthful. <laughs> but not really, but I'm not very partial to answering complicated questions when I'm about to go to sleep. So you have your moments when it's not good. When they're watching television, do men, an like, exciting moment on the rugby, is it the right moment to speak? <laughs> You have to ask, when is it the right time? And, and the book that was most helpful to me was called 
when to speak up and when to shut up. Isn't that gorgeous? When to speak up and when to shut up. And I think this illustration, which I'll end with, is for me the most amazing story of a, of a counsellor. He was young. He just learned how to be a counsellor. He was a, an assistant pastor in a church and a woman had a problem. Let me tell it as a story rather than read it. This woman came to him and said, um, he, she, he said, what's your problem? She said, well, after 25 years of marriage, I cannot bear to be in the same house as my husband. Oh, he said, well, what do you plan to do about it? He said, well, I'm going to walk out. Oh, he said, well, have you thought about the consequences? I really couldn't care. Well, have you spoken to him? No, I haven't. He, he, he just get, carries on with life as if nothing's wrong. Oh, he said, he wasn't, he wasn't sure what to say to her. And he said, and your daughter? Well, yeah, there is a problem with my daughter. She's in her final year, and if she's going to graduate, it wouldn't be so good if I just walked out. So the counselor said, well, what do you think you should do? She says, I think I should find a lawyer. All right, fine, well, find a lawyer and come back and tell me. Well, she didn't come back. But his last words to her was, what I would recommend, my dear, why don't you wait a year? Let your daughter graduate and see if things don't settle down. Just give your marriage one more year. And then there was silence, nothing more. Until the most incredible news came to this counselor's ears. This husband had a sudden heart attack and died. And the girl said, this woman said to him when she went to him for counseling, saying, my husband has died. He said to her, did you ever tell him you were going to divorce him? She said, thankfully, I didn't. Because he said you would live with guilt for the rest of your life if you had walked out and he had died of a heart attack. You would never have known if you were the cause or he had a condition. And she said, thank you, Lord. You didn't preach to me about, mm, it's not good to this, not good for that. You just said, give it a year. And I, I went cold when I read that. I thought, you know what? We don't know what words, it ha what the effect words have on our friends, our family. But listen for God's prompting. Listen for his prompting. And that to me is the truth. Thanks be to God for giving us the victory, for cleansing our hearts, for taming our tongues, for giving us the desire to speak the truth in love, however hard that might be, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts may be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This little one is saying quite loudly, she needs comfort. <laughs> Shall we pray? He came not into the world to condemn the world, but the world might know that he is love. God is love. He wants to love you this morning, to embrace you. But if the Holy Spirit has touched a sore place, a delicate place, and forgiveness or honesty or open sharing needs to happen, then let the Holy Spirit be the one to lead. And the one who listens and the one who responds will bring healing to a relationship that has long needed healing. So thank you, Lord, that you give us that wisdom, you give us that peace, you give us your Holy Spirit to deal with these things that are so hard for us to face. But we have said, take my voice and let it be, take my words and let them be. We have sung that this morning, Lord. And so as we end with this next song, we just thank you that it is love divine that makes all